Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I work as a port consultant or a consultant for the industry. So uh, I'm not an engineer by training. So a lot of what I do is feasibility studies and market studies for new port projects. So I thought to bring that experience in and basically look at some of the dynamics that are taking place in the industry from the point of view of basically investors and lenders, but also try to like take out some potential opportunities that um, might be emerging out of the general trends, particularly environment, so climate change, and the second one is technology. And I'm going to pick up uh, on what Jessica said at the very beginning concerning uh, working in silos and um, difficulties in attracting private sector financing or private sector investments. So I'll try to focus on that and also pick up on the earlier conversation we were having about um, investing and basically the objectives and the priorities. Um, so the purpose of this first slide is essentially to give some context. And the message here is to say that uh, the macroeconomy, the drivers uh, underpinning the industry um, is have been changing and are changing, but really um, at the back of that, who is actually investing in the port really influences what happens. And this is just based on my own experience. So as we know, as we said, ports are the node um, of, of a broader value chain, a trade chain. And the driver for port investment or the, uh, the business underpinning of a port investment really is trade. And that in turn is inextricably linked to economic growth. So it is very natural to see that locations in near proximity to large populations, to very specific locations um, or ports that are in near proximity to large manufacturing hubs or industry, those are the ports that will be attracting private sector investments. Um, it is more difficult to attract invest, investment and to um, find financing for smaller ports that don't necessarily have the large volumes that would um, allow um, the, let's say, financial viability to be, to be shown to be that strong. That said, different projects have different priorities. And I really want to emphasize this. Ultimately, the feasibilities, the, the type of studies that I do essentially look at CapEx and OpEx. So capital, the size of the capital investment, the size of the operational expenses. I value that against uh, the financing costs and the revenues uh, and therefore the tariffs. And then I look at that in respect to the risks but it really depends on who is investing. So we have large operators. So the big players in the industry like Hutchison Port Holdings, APMT, PSA International, APMT, these companies have very large port port portfolios. And a lot of their thinking about investments in ports have to do with strategy and the broader portfolio. Then we have mining and oil and gas projects that need a port to export their products or imports their, import their inputs. And therefore, if a port is the bottleneck, they will pursue that investment. Uh, we have capacity constraints, which will then drive capacity, capacity investments in ports. And we also have development requires which, uh, requirements, which we were talking about earlier. And, and, and Essentially, a lot of the time, it's a chicken and egg situation. We need ports to foster economic development, but we cannot justify the investment unless we have certainty over the volumes. So that is a big problem for a lot of smaller communities. Um, next slide, please. So the key message of this slide really is to say that the Port financing and particularly lending has changed. And this has been a very interesting thing for me to follow. Earlier in time, so ports are capital intensive investments. They require uh, a, a long time in order to um, make up the, the investment. And earlier banks would be willing to um, strike deals that would be 20, 30 years. 
That is not the case anymore. All the projects that I work in have payback periods of less than 10 years. That includes infrastructure banks. And the margins for those loans are high, despite inflation rates being low. And this, the requirements around that lending have increased. And this has particularly been the case because of climate risks, such as transition risks uh, to do with the energy transition. Or for example, it would be very difficult today to finance a port specifically catering to the coal industry, for example. And the other are the physical risks. So what are the actual physical risks associated with climate change that will impact our port? What additional capex do we have to put into that in investment in order to ensure that we are mitigating those risks? Next slide, please. So here I just wanted to highlight some potential opportunities of the energy transition. And this might be very relevant for the Arctic, for Arctic from two points of view. One is the fact that this trans energy transition is allowing new players to enter the maritime sector, which is the maritime sector, as we know, is quite conservative. The bunkering sector, which is basically the fueling of the ships, has, has been dominated by oil companies. That is now changing, and part of it is driven by the um, emission targets related to the industry. Um, as you might know, the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, is leading on this, and the industry target is a uh, reduction of 50% emissions by 2050. One of the way the industry wants to pursue this is changing the way ships are propelled, so essentially the fuel, and they want to move from fuel oil to alternative fuels. An example that I like to drop on is um, Yara, which is a Norwegian fertilizer uh, company. And um, they were not a big player in the sector, but now they are finding an opportunity to enter the sector because of their production of ammonia, which is one of the inputs for fertilizer. And ammonia is being, um, being considered as one of the main zero carbon fuels for shipping going forward. So this is just to highlight how this transitioning is opening opportunities. And for me, the Arctic might be a, a well-placed um, community or set of communities and environment to pursue this particular angle, particularly when it comes to renewables for partnerships and, um, and other types of uh, opportunities. Um, so this is definitely for me, one of the main transition elements that could create opportunities. And next slide, please. Okay, this was about overcoming the silos. And these are process maps um, of an import and an export process in um, a country that I worked with for a port. And the key point that I want to make is, is actually echoes what um, uh, my colleague said earlier, which is that with technology, I think we have the technology. What we don't necessarily, what we are not necessarily always clear about is what is the problem we're trying to tackle through this technology. And I've seen this happen in many cases in a lot of projects I've been on. So um, I wanted to basically socialize this concept of trade facilitation, which is uh, the umbrella term that essentially looks at the reduction of cost and time of trade. And um, I'll, I'll say that this, this is an example of the process map that I developed for a Liberia in West Africa. And their commodities are really expensive. Very basic co food commodities are three, four, five times the price that you would find them in other West African countries. And part of the reason is the logistics costs associated with shipping uh, commodities in and out of the country. So what I was asked to do is essentially identify where the bottlenecks are. And it's only after that has been identified that we started thinking about what technologies to use in order to shut those bottlenecks down. But one of the benefits of this type of approach is also that you have an evidence, a base, a data information evidence that around which stakeholders can then come together to discuss the problem because a lot of the problems associated with silo mentality and ways of working is that everyone tends to blame each other for the bottleneck and nothing ever gets done. 
So just basically my message here is to, you know, pursue clarity over where the problems are. And, and the technology is probably the least of the problem because that is very much available. Um, last slide, please. We've already discussed the blue economy. The only thing I wanted to say about this is that it's an umbrella concept around which financing, like um, development banks, for example, or governments are constructing financing instruments for ports and uh, the broader maritime sector. I think that this concept of this framework is a good opportunity for smaller actors in the industry. And it allows um, financing instruments that would otherwise not have been allowed. And uh, key to me is biodiversity, um, aquaculture, and uh, renewables, as well as the other factors listed here. These are all areas that can definitely benefit from all the instruments and policies that are being developed around this uh, blue economy framework. That's me. Thank you very much.